then now we are coming to um, to the, the Monday meeting. It's a little unusual because there is just one decision but two uh, speakers. Um, and, uh, and we will use the entire session. Now, uh, you might think is that ex exaggerated, uh, but I, I think it's not because possibly the, uh, the decision that we will be presenting is the most important since Van Gent and Loos and Costenel 60 years ago. And uh, I'm very careful in using superlatives because it's a slippery thing to use a superlative, but uh, I use it here. So what is the decision? Um, actually, there are two decisions. It's the decision uh, 156 on Hungary and uh, the one that we have here, 157 on, uh, on Poland. They are to 98% identical, uh, but the court didn't join the cases um, for respect, I would say, to, uh, uh, to the plaintiffs. Now, I had hoped that uh, someone would present those decisions at some point, but uh, that didn't happen. So I decided to present them myself. Now it's a little late because it's almost two years, but I'm not alone in doing so because uh, next to me, there is Kai Ziegner. He has been a member at this Institute. And now he's a refrendaire at the Court of Justice and he is the refrendaire for the judge uh, rapporteur who drafted that. And indeed uh, he was uh, very important. I heard from many sides in drafting this uh, uh, um, this decision, and I must say, I am, I'm very proud that someone from the Institute has had a role in drafting this uh, decision, as I'm very proud that uh, of Rainer Hoffmann, who is there, and Rainer Hoffmann from University of Frankfurt, he's also a former member of the Institute, and he, um, in 86, largely wrote the Solange II decision, you know, and uh, at, the, uh, at the Federal Constitutional Court, being a clerk to uh, Steinberger. And um, in that decision uh, looms the magic but dangerous words of identity. You know, that is the whole thing is construed around uh, identity. And uh, he succeeded, they succeeded in, in, in 86 to put it to good use because um, the 86 along its way decision is Perhaps probably the best example of European constitutional European constitutional pluralism that is a, an approach that has been theorized famously by Neil McCormick, Miguel Maduro, and Neil Walker. But uh, the real thing is uh, is what has been thought up in in eighty six. So what does this decision uh, that we are discussing today? What will it do to European legal pluralism? I think that is the key question that we will be discussing. So to discuss with that, there are more people. So from Brussels, we have, um, from Brussels at the Commission, we have Matthias Schmidt, also a former member at the Institute. Now he works at the European Commission and it, actually he works in the unit that deals with the rule of law. So what we will be discussing is uh, his business. There's also Giacomo Ruggio, also a former member of the Institute. He's now at the Legal Service of the Council in charge of conditionality. And we have, uh, Esther Botner from Hungary, and we have uh, from uh, Poland, we have Anna Wojciech. So I think we have a good crowd, a good group to discuss that, not least because we have uh, Dimitri Spieker and Andreas Knecht who are also deep into that issue. Okay, no, no, back. So what is uh, the decision that we are discussing? It's this decision of uh, 16 February, 2002, Poland v. Um, um, the uh, Parliament and Council. So why is it so interesting? This case shows excellently the group that probably forever, but certainly in the last 30 years has been defining the path of European integration. Uh, and that is very nicely put in a recent book by Damon Hodson, Circle of Stars, the history of the EU and the people who made it in Yale University Press uh, last year, 2023. And um, Hodson makes a step ahead of uh, what has been the most famous historian of the constitutional history of the Union, that is to say, Van Middelaar, because he tells us a broader story. So Van Middelaar tells a story that is focused on the European Council. Now, um, uh, and he, he tells a broader story. Now, 
what is that um, what is that story and so i give you now the plot the plot of this case so that were uh, difficult days of the european union many scholars in particular scholars hailing from the anglo-saxon world predicted disintegration and eventual failing of the european union for the COVID crisis and the economic depression that came with it for authoritarian tendencies in the European Union and also for the need of a new budget, because as you will know, a new budget requires unanimity and approval by member states. So just a new budget is enough for a crisis, but the depression for COVID and the authoritarian tendencies that many luminaries, in particular from the Anglo-Saxon world, that is that, that finally will be the death of um, the, of the union. So we have high drama, that's the plot. Now who's in the cast? And here we come back to Hodgson. Of course, as Van Midler also would put it, they are the head of government who are pushing, and that is about above all uh, for Merkel, the German chancellor, the French president, and the, um, and the Dutch prime minister Rutte. So that is the first group. But then there's a second group, which is very important, and that are the top EU officials. So Ursula von der Leyen played a very important role. Jeppe Tan, uh, Tanhol, the Secretary General of the Council, played in a very important role. And the heads of the legal services, Calleja and the, the Gregorio, which you fi all find in this, uh, in this case. And then, of course, you have uh, Con Lennart, the president of the court, uh, an EU federalist, uh, I think the most powerful president uh, for a long time, if I understand correctly, has been re-elected with, with 26 votes out of 27, which is, is quite something. And we have the reporting judge, Arabajev, is that pronounced correctly? Arabajev. Arabajev, and that's the person for whom Kai Ziegler clerks. Now that Arabajev is the reporting judge, that is not, that is not an accident because um, uh, and that is how a case distribution works at the European Court of Justice. So it is the president who selects uh, the judge rapporteur. And of course, the judge rapporteur knows uh, the ideas and the quality of, uh, of the various judges. There's a very interesting study on that by Christoph Krenn um, in that respect. So it's the power of the president. So it's, it's, not a, it's not an accident that he was selected. So who is he? So he is uh, born in 40. 49, so he's 75 years old. He has been a judge at the, uh, at the Constitutional Court of Bulgaria. She comes from Bulgaria. He has been the judge and I think also the president, right, of the, uh, of the court. He was then a member of the National Assembly, so he has been a politician. Um, he has been to the European Commission of Human Rights. So um, he has been at the, at the, um, at the uh, Constitutional uh, Treaty negotiation. So it's someone who really knows. And it's not someone to be pushed around, uh, I imagine, from this Vita. So that is the second group that is missing in Van Middela. But, but uh, what's against his name? Uh, Hodgson says that is the second group that you need to keep in, in, in mind. You know, the, the elite of, uh, of the European institutions. You know, that is a group that has its own power. And then there's a third group. And that, that makes this boot really important. And he said, forever, European integration has also been framed by those who often are called populists or which are called national sovereignists. That is the third important group. If you want to understand how the union is construed and how it works, you need to look at that group. And of course here, again, the cast is best because who is in the cast? Kaczynski and Orban. So Kaczynski and Orban are two of the most powerful politicians in Europe and I think we can say also of the most gifted politicians in Europe. So very important. So that's that's the cast, and I think it's it's a good cast for a good uh, uh, a good play because Kaczynski and Orban, I think, at the political level, they are at the level of Merkel and Van der Leyen. Yeah. So it's Goldfinger and James Bond. That's a good story. So that's the plot. Now, how well if oh, I, I will take more than twenty five minutes. Bear with me. So. Um, uh, how will I develop the story? We will start with some framing, so the importance of the case, um, how to read a decision, that is the reasons for reasons, and then some background. Then we will go into the decision, we will look into the issue, the structure of the decision, and then the key reasoning, and that is, so three, three is, what is the new holy gospel of EU law? 
the new Holy Gospel, and I will bring it to you smoothly. And then the last point will there be uh, the impact that is, what did it do with respect to confronting authoritarian, authoritarian tendencies and function? Uh, and the very important move from functional constitutionalism to principled constitutionalism, because I think that if we want to give it a theoretical frame, that is what has happened finally in this, uh, in this decision, why I think it is so important. Okay, so um, next, yeah. So why is it important? First of all, the court tells us, the court tells us uh, because it's the full court. You know, it's very rare. How much are there? Three, four, five a year? No, uh, one. One. So maybe in exceptional circumstances, there's some years without any. Yeah. So it's, it's once or twice a year that you have the full court. That's the first thing that tells you that. Then it's, you see in that week, the 16th February, that's a Wednesday. And it's the only, these two decisions are the only decisions that are given on that day. So it, it cleared the entire week so that the full attention went to this, uh, to this decision. The speed, it's less than a year, you know, it's less than a year. It was brought on March 11 and it was delivered in, uh, uh, in February. And that is the full court uh, in a very complex case. So it was very, very speedy. And then it's, uh, it's the number of interveners. Yeah, so look who is uh, showing up there, Belgium, Denmark, all. Uh, it's also very rare that so many uh, show up, and um, and uh, then it's the length. It's 364 paragraphs, and depending on the format, it's between 56 and 74 pages. You know, I don't know why it's it. And then finally, it is important because the court introduced the trigger word, identity. You know, so I think all these things come there to tell us here something very important is, uh, is, uh, is happening. Now, um, uh, we go to the next slide. So very briefly, the reasons for the reason. So 50% of our research is studying uh, court decisions and the arguments in court decisions. But of course, uh, so we need, that is for the understanding, for explaining, for critiquing and systematizing the arguments, the reasons. That's the core business. Now, for whom are they written? So if you could go on, of course, it's a, it's a provision. You know, judgments shall, be, shall state the reasons on which they are based. So they have to do that. But what is the function? Or since I'm not a system theorist, what are the functions in plural? Because I think there are uh, various. So, of course, the first function is, and I'm curious on how you are, how you will be commenting this. The first is controlling the courts. Uh, the duty to give reasons was introduced in the 18th century in order to control the courts, and there was fierce resistance against uh, this obligation because the court didn't want to be controlled. But eventually, so it is for controlling the courts, and of course, for the court of justice, it's very important because. You know, every judge, every six years needs to be reappointed, except if you are 75, probably you're not considering reappointment, but all the others every six years. So, uh, and all the judges have that in mind. But, um, but then there are the national courts. And of course, we know that the national courts are scrutinizing the, uh, the European Court of Justice, in particular, the German Federal Constitutional Court, with its ultra-virus doctrine that it's triggered in um, the PSPP. Um, so the court knows that this decision that impinges so heavily on national constitutional autonomy, you know, it will be, it will be read very critically by very important players. That is the first, uh, the first element. But then the second element, and that was an unintended consequence of introducing the, the requirement of uh, giving reasons. The court found out that it is a wonderful instrument of power because it became a powerful instrument of lawmaking. There's no other argument as important for a court than its former decisions. So, um, uh, so giving reasons became a supreme way of lawmaking, thereby empowering uh, the courts, and that is accepted. The court speaks of its case law. Everybody speaks of the case law of the Court of Justice, and of course this means uh, something. And here, we, of course, we have lawmaking because it stabilizes a new understanding of European constitutionalism for allowing and even demanding a principled interpretation of all EU law. 
which of course expands the reach enormously. Then there is the issue of seeking acceptance um, and legitimacy. That is so important because there's such a backlash against courts. So, you know, when courts are writing uh, their decisions, they have that in mind. They need, they need acceptance, they need uh, legitimacy. So the question is, uh, by whom? Those who won, you don't need so much legitimacy, but those who lost. Um, actually, Orban, it seems, was not so impressed because I heard that he has been said, we have been raped judicially. Is that true? Do you know that? But we, 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 were, we, we might discuss it. So there was very strong language on that. But there are others um, from which it seeks uh, legitimacy, and that is the community of practice. And that is also a very diverse group because, first of all, you have the European institutions. So there is the commission and there's the tandem between the court and the commission in order to develop the, there's the, the council. Um, there's the European Council. The European Council is the most quoted institution in, uh, in the decision. Then there are the member states, which again is a diverse group. You have the governments, you have the legal services in the ministries, and you have, of course, the courts. You have the attorneys, you know, you want to have new cases on that basis. So you have to speak to the attorneys. And at the end, they have to speak to us. To academia. Academia is a very important, uh, a very important. So that is a new way, uh, another element, it's seeking legitimacy. And then there's one element, and I wonder what you will say on that. I think it's on fixing agreements in the court, or compromises in the court. So remember how, it's, how complex such a case is, and there will be very different opinion among the judges. And <clears throat> so a judge will say, you know, I, I will go along with that decision, with that outcome, but I want this in the decision. So I think we also need to read the decisions, uh, the decisions in that light. And indeed, we have one indication that it was very much discussed because 95% of what I will be telling you now is not in the opinion of the Advocate General. So the whole thing, why I think it is important, we think it is such, a, it's not in the decision of the Advocate General. And that is important to know if you know how a case goes at the, at the European Court of Justice. It goes to the president, the president gives it to the judge rapporteur, the judge rapporteur and his or uh, her clerks write a first opinion, then it goes to the uh, Réunion Générale, and then the advocate general writes. So the advocate general has an idea where the judge rapporteur was going, and I would imagine that, you know, if you want to come up with identity, it's somehow in the first, in the first report. Nothing of that is in, in the Advocate General's. So I imagine that there was somehow a decision whether to use identity or not, and we will see in a moment that it's a big, uh, it's a big thing. So also that is, um, uh, that is something we read. Okay, now what is the um, next? Uh, so what is the issue here? The background of the case. The ca background of the case are three issues. The first one, of course, is how to deal with authoritarian tendencies in the European Union. That was a, a, a very big issue. And um, whereas at the beginning, people thought, well, that is a problem for Poland and that is a problem for Hungary. Uh, somehow they understood it's, uh, it's a problem for all of us. It's a problem for European society and we need to do something about it. So that is a and very hard to do something because, as I told you, very gifted politicians. Um, then the next thing is um, extra money for the economic downturn caused by COVID. You know whether the, Euro the European Union should go into debt in order to have uh, economic growth. U incredibly difficult topic. And then, of course, a new, a new, um, a new budget. So with respect to doing something about the rule of law crisis, having a legal act, uh, uh, of, uh, many, so many countries said, we go into debt, there will be a new a budget, but we don't want to pay Orban and Kaczynski. So we want a legal instrument in order to, to sanction those people. As you can imagine, Orban and Kaczynski said, only over our dead bodies, uh, that will happen. And now, uh, we have the unfolding of the uh, of the plot, and we don't really know how it works. But we had uh, Merkel, we had von der Leyen, we had Tranhol, uh, and we had the engineering that ended in the European Council of 10 and 11 December 2020. And it's very nicely described in the Circle of Stars and the chapter how these things are uh, that 
explains to us how these things work is has as a title sorry you won't leave the room now uh, sorry you was so and that means the the prime minister or the, uh, or the, the head of state you will stay you have to stay in the european council until we have found a decision yeah, perhaps a p but that's it um, and that's how these things then come to um, come to an end. And here we had the compromise. We have the regulation. We have the we have the uh, next generation EU, and we have the next budget. So uh, that was that is quite um, uh, that is quite something. Part of the compromise was that Poland and that the instrument will only be applied once that the Court of Justice has decided that it is legal if a case has been brought. So, of course, Poland and Hungary brought the case. They gained a year. Um, and um, and uh, but it is uh, it is here. So it's a true dispute on a, on a really big thing. And here I also want to remember the two first cases that we all remember when we think about European Union law, Fahent and Los and Costa Enel. First of all, they were both engineered cases no real cases but cases brought by european federalists in order to get the whole thing going so here that was a real dispute and um, there were really minor cases so uh, costa Enel, it was about something which today would be 50 euros here we are speaking of hundreds of billions of euros yeah so just it gives you the magnitude of uh, of the development. Okay, now we go to the uh, to the decision. Um, we go on. So, what is it about? It is about um, uh, the applic here. Here we read it. It's from it's. It goes against uh, the decision 20, 2029 on a general regime of conditionality for the protection of the union budget. We go on. I have to speed up. And. Uh, what is it about? That is Article 1 of this uh, regulation. It says the regulation establishes the rule necessary for the protection of the union budget in case of breaches of the principles of the rule of law in member states. So again, imagine the problem in Poland and in, in Hungary, and that is the instrument. Now, the question of, of all the questions there were, is there competence in EU law to do that? Next. So the only thing that there is is this one, the, EU, the European Parliament and the Council acting in accordance with the ordinary legislative procedure shall adopt by means of regulation. And now it comes. So again, it's about not giving hundred, uh, uh, tens of billions of, Euro, of euros to Hungary and Poland because there's a problem with the independence of the judiciary and so on. Yeah. So that goes under the financial rules shall shall adopt the financial rules which determine the procedure for the imp for implementing the budget and for auditing accounts so you have to put this regulation under the procedure for implementing the budget and for auditing accounts that's a tall business yeah to put that under this um uh under this uh this um uh, provision so um, and indeed, so the Polish and the uh, Hungarians they put their lawyers uh, to work, and they have uh, good lawyers. So they bring um, um, next one. Yes. No, we we don't do that. We we, we go straight. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very complex decision. It's a very complex decision, very long. But we will be now looking at the part. That is important because on most the pleas that the, that these two bring, you know, you write one, two, three pages, but then there are there is one point where you write uh, twenty seven, right? So you can imagine that that is the part that is uh, that is uh, important. Uh, go on. Shall we go to the no. structure? No, we don't do the structure. We don't have the time. Yeah. Um, so now we go to the new gospel. The new gospel is interesting that before the gospel, yeah, you find more or less 95% the arguments of the advocate general. 
And the Advocate General, as you can imagine, already came to the conclusion that Article 322 is kosher for that regulation. But the Advocate General does that with the usual means of doing, you know, so it's the wording and the context and the history and some telos. And it's a, it's a very technical argument. It's a constitutional free argument that he makes. And uh, with that argument, he comes to the conclusion, and it's a meaningful conclusion that even though it's a little difficult, but uh, you know, with the usual techniques of EU law, you can do it, you can do it decently. And more or less, what the decision does is it repeats those arguments. It's a little different, but basically it's the same argument. So the court has could, could, could have stopped there. So you might say all the rest that comes now, all the beauty, is it just an orbiter dictum? Because it was not necessary to decide. I don't think so. I don't think it's orbiter. Because um, what the court of what the advocate general shows us is that it is possible to put the regulation under Article 322. What the arguments that you were developing now and we are looking into is that it is the right thing to do. That it is not just legal, but that it is legitimate. And I think if you're in such a situation, such a critical situation of the European Union, the court needs on, not only speak to legality, but it also needs to speak to legitimacy. And so the court uses the case, a very high profile case, to make a high profile statement of what the EU is um, about. So it makes a claim on the core of EU constitutional law, or as the court puts it, on identity. And we now just walk, I just walk you through the new holy gospel and then I will give over to, to Kai. So what does it say? I, I will read it out to you because it's just, uh, you know, in the, uh, so it says in that regard, so here starts, you know, in that regard, it should be pointed out that under article two, the European Union is founded on values, such as the rule of law, which are common to the member state and that in accordance with article 49, respect for those values is a prerequisite for the accession to the union of any European state applying to become a member of the European Union. See to that effect, uh, Eurobox promotion. What does that decision say? Eurobox promotion says, independence of the judiciary is so important that a national court must disrespect the decision of its constitutional court if it goes against that. That is what Eurobox promotes. So it's the, it's hard to say, you know, if you could say anything stronger to a, to a subordinate court, what to do with its constitutional court. Next slide. It goes on. As stated in recital five of the contested regulation, once a candidate state becomes a member state, it joins a legal structure that is based on the fundamental premise that each member state share with all member states with all the other member states and recognizes that they share with it the common values contained in Article 2 on which the European Union is founded. That premise is based on the specific and essential characteristics. It gets ever, ever stronger. It must have been wonderful to write it. That premise is based on the specific and essential characteristics of EU law, which stem from the very, it's not just the nature, it's the very nature of EU law and the autonomy it enjoys in relation to the laws of the member states and to international law. That premise implies and justifies the exact existence of mutual trust between the member states, that those values will be recognized and therefore that the European EU law that implements it will be respected. Opinion 213, as yourselves in the account of Swiss Portuguese and uh, Republica, so 213, it's the beginning of the new principle interpretation. It's the, it's the beginning of the, uh, of the new constitutionalism that validates the constitutional shift with the Lisbon Treaty. As you saw, is the beginning of the applicability of Article 2 and Republica is the, pro the prohibition of constitutional regression. So next slide. It follows that compliance by a member state with the values contained in Article 2 is a condition for the enjoyment of all the rights deriving from the application of the treaties to that member states, again, Republica, Eurobox promotion and uh, Associatia 
um, that is a name, another Romanian case on independence. Very important, all those cases cited are against other member states than Hungary and Poland. To show you, we did, don't single you out. There are all the others. Not one of those did go against Hungary and Poland. Okay, next. So, not yet. No, 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 back, back, back. The values want, no, no, 145. <laughs> Yeah. The values content in Article 2, you, you feel the climax, uh, the value, but it's almost done, it's almost done. The values content in Article 2 have been identified and shared by the member states. Two assertions, the values content in Article have been identified by the member states and it has been your free choice. And the values content in Article 2 are shared by the member states. In Republican terms, we are living in a society that is characterized by those values of democratic constitutionalism. That's what it says here. And this is why, this is why they, these values, define the very identity of the European Union as a common legal order. Next. So where does that come from? Karl Schmidt Verfassungslehre 1928. Yeah, that is that is where it comes from, and it also comes next. No, oh, you list. <laughs> and it comes, of course, from uh, Bundesverfassungsgericht. So lange eins Bundesverfassungsgericht, so lange zwei Bundesverfassungsgericht Lissabon Urteil. You know that it's the Germans who put it, who gave it that important. And thus it finishes. Thus, the Europe. No, 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 no. Back. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. To destroy the drama. <laughs> no, uh, thus, the European Union must be able to defend those values within the limits and its powers as laid down by uh, the treaties. And so, interpreting Article 3 to 2 as allowing for regulation 2092 is not just one among several possibilities, but it's the right thing to do. That is the argument. Next slide. So, go. So that brings me to, to the impact. One is uh, confronting authoritarian tendencies. Did it help? Actually, this regulation is not so important, but it encouraged to use other instruments very forcefully against those countries. And in th indeed, things are moving. So it did something in confronting. And in, uh, in more uh, legal and theoretical terms, it is, it is I think the final move from functional to principled uh, constitutionalism. That's why I think it is important and I'm looking forward to your comment.